Hello, welcome back. I'm Lennart Martens from Ghent University and VIB, and we're at our third lecture in mass spectrometry basics, and today we'll talk about mass analyzer. So what we've done before in the first lecture is we covered amino acids and proteins, and how the properties of the amino acids make proteins such useful molecules, and how we can use these properties in mass spectrometry. Then we talked about the overall concepts of mass spectrometry, and then the ion sources, which were the topic of the second lecture. Now, remember the ion source was really important. The ion source allowed us to take our analyte molecules from the samples and turn them into ions in the gas phase. And this was really crucially important because you need ions to analyze them in the mass analyzer. And that's where we are today. We are at the mass analyzers, our very sophisticated pair of scales that will find out how much a particular molecule has as mass. Now, in order to do so, I've already told you that they use electrical fields, and so we'll be seeing this throughout the presentation, how these electrical fields are being used in different ways to measure mass. Okay, let's start with our first type of mass analyzer, the time of flight. Now, it's a very descriptive name again, because it's going to be all about timing the time of flight of a particular ion. So how does it work? We have the source over here, and remember the source is always this, uh, this dark blue, and the source can be electrospray or MALDI. It doesn't really matter for the time of flight. It can be either one of these. So it generates ions in the gas phase. Now these ions will then encounter what is known as an extraction plate, which is this thing here. And you can visually imagine it as a kind of chicken wire, um, loosely knitted uh, piece of, of, of metal, where there's a lot of holes and a few wires. Now this extraction plate is at a high voltage. It's at 30,000 volts or so. And obviously our ions are going to see this plate and the electrical field that it generates and they will migrate towards this electrical field. So in a way this is an acceleration device that given a certain uh, voltage is going to generate a certain amount of acceleration and therefore velocity in the ions. Now what comes then is this thing is mostly hollow remember it's mostly open space with a few small wires in between and so the ions are going to fly through generally and then they will enter this green contraption, which is essentially a very finely mach machined long tube. This tube is at high vacuum as everything else is since the source. So it's a very high vacuum tube. And most importantly, there is no electrical field in this tube. And that's why they call this a field free tube. So it's essentially just that. It's a vacuum tube machined to very precise dimensions. Obviously, the ions that have been accelerated through this electrical field generated by our extraction plate, they will have a certain velocity. And now with that velocity, because there is no resistance from the air, it's vacuum, and because there is no electrical field, they will just continue with this speed and travel along the length of this tube. And at the very end, we will have a detector, and we'll talk about how these things work in the next lecture. But there will be a detector, and that will be able to find out when a molecule has traversed this field-free tube. Now, these tubes are pretty long. They're typically longer than a meter. And there's a reason why they're long, but we'll get back to that. So now let's have a look at a small animation to see what happens in this uh, type of flight analyzer. So we have our sample ions. And the sample ions are being moved by the extraction plate and they receive a kinetic energy that is equivalent to the charge of the individual molecule here, or ion, and the voltage that we have applied. So the strength of the field and the charge. Obviously, if you have twice the charge, you will feel the field twice as strongly. A two plus ion will feel a similar field, it will feel the same field with twice the strength of a one plus ion. Now, that is the kinetic energy that these ions receive. And so, they will start moving with a certain speed that, as you know, relates to the kinetic energy. So this is a secondary school education. The kinetic energy of a moving object is the mass times the velocity squared divided by 2. Now, we know where this kinetic energy comes from. It comes from the voltage, and this voltage is something that is under our control. That means that we can figure out somehow something about this speed and this mass. In fact, we can say that the speed is equivalent, or will be equivalent, to the square root of two times the kinetic energy divided by mass. It's simply solving this equation for velocity. As you can see, a large ion should move slower than a small ion, 
because a small ion has a, slow, has a smaller mass, and since the speed will be inversely proportional to mass, small ions will go faster. Do note that there is an exception, and the exception is if the very large ion with a large mass actually has a high charge, it could actually go faster because the kinetic energy would be higher. Okay? But by and large, for the same charges state, the more massive ion will go slower. So speed gives us something about the mass. In fact, we see a relationship between the speed and the mass. Now, the way that we work this out is we work with the laws of kinetics and a little bit of uh, uh, calculation here. We say that the speed can be expressed as the distance covered in a given amount of time. Since we know the distance, the length of this tube, we can calculate how long it takes for the ion to traverse this tube, and then we know what speed that ion had. So the speed comes from the time of flight of a fixed distance. So we know when we've switched on the extraction plate and when we switch it off. So we have an idea of when this ion enters the tube, and then we know when it hits the detector. So we actually can, with a very accurate stopwatch, determine how long it takes for the ion to fly through the tube, hence time of flight. Now that gives us velocity, and as you can see, velocity relates to mass, but we still have the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is of course related to the charge and the voltage, so we can fill that out here. So two times the uh, charge and the voltage divided by the mass square root gives us the velocity, and velocity of course is distance traveled divided by time taken. And when you fill all of that out in these equations, which is an exercise for the viewer, you can do this yourself, but you should end up with this equation. Mass over charge equals two times the voltage divided by the velocity squared. And of course, we solve velocity uh, by distance traveled divided by time. That's squared, of course. And we end up with this final equation that the mass over charge equals two times the voltage applied times the time traveled squared divided by the distance traveled squared. Let's see what we know about this. We do not know mass and we do not know charge. So we're actually trying to find these out. We do know two because that's rather simple. We know V, the voltage, because that's something that we told the instrument to apply on this extraction plate. So we have a voltage source that's regulated very tightly regulated and we can set it very precisely. We also know the time traveled because that's our stopwatch that's built into the mass spectrometer. And we know the distance traveled because we know how long this tube was to begin with. And so in total we can resolve, we can resolve any term here, but we cannot resolve these two. And this is an important thing. What we see here is that while we resolve the mass over charge, we cannot distinguish between different charge states of different ions. So we always measure mass over charge together, never mass alone or charge alone. And this is a really big limitation. Now, if you were to think of this, if you think of this, we actually talked about this in the ion sources where the Maldi source, if you will recall, has only singly charged ions and when you analyze peptides. So there it's quite easy because Q is always one. And so this whole equation becomes very simple. We are actually capable of reading the mass. For an electrospray source, which are more popular because they can be ran 24 seven and automated, we don't have this luxury. Charge can be two plus, three plus, four plus, five plus, and we simply don't know. So this is a downside of using electrospray. We have multiply charged ions and we have no way of resolving that charge from the mass spectrometry measurement. So a mass spectrometer always measures mass over charge. Now, mind you, I've, I've written Q here for the charge, which is the way a physicist would write charge. Mass spectrometrists, however, don't. They use the letter Z or Z, and so it's always M over Z. Mass over charge is M over Z. They never write M over Q, okay? So I apologize for using the uh, correct units here, uh, or the correct uh, variables in physics. In fact, it's M over Z, that is being referred to by most mass, uh, mass spectrometrists. Now, there's another thing we should note. What we are measuring here is mass, and it's not gravitational mass. What we are measuring is inertial mass. 
So the resistance of a particular molecule to acceleration. Having said that, to the best of our current measurements, gravitational mass and inertial mass are equivalent. So there might still be some differences, but we haven't been able to measure the difference. But it's an interesting point. We measure in inertial mass, not gravitational mass. So that's how a time of flight analyzer works. It's a very sophisticated scale that uses electrical fields and then the time of flight through a tube. There's one other caveat though, and that is that this tube tends to be made out of metal. And you all know what happens with metal when the temperature changes. If the temperature shrinks, or goes down, sorry, the metal tube will shrink in size. If the temperature goes up, it will expand. And so this tube, despite the fact of being, despite the fact of it being very, very precisely machined, will not be exactly the same length at any given time. Small fluctuations in temperature will create fluctuations in uh, length, and the fluctuations are sufficient to be detectable by our very advanced chronometer built into this mass spectrometer. So we somehow need to figure out what the actual length is of this tube every time we use it. And for that, we do calibration. And calibration is incredibly important if you want precise measurements. The way it works is very simple. Rather than resolving for mass over charge, we're now going to resolve this equation for x. And the way to solve for x is to put in a molecule of which we know the mass over charge. So you take a known analyte where you know which mass over charge it will take in your instrument, and then you use that in the instrument and you calculate back what the x should be. And that gives you the actual length of the tube at that point in time. So the best way to do it is to do it with the sample. So when you take an analysis a spectrum, there should be an, what they call internal calibrant present in that spectrum too. And then the calibrant allows you to calibrate that spectrum perfectly and therefore get a more accurate mass of the analyte. That is not always possible, but people try very hard to get their calibrants as closely spaced in time to the actual analytes as possible. Right? So calibration is really critical. You always need to calibrate your mass spectrometers, and this is the reason why. The other mass spectrometers, the other analyzers that we will be talking about, all need to be calibrated. But it's nice to show you here why calibration is so important. Okay, so without further ado, let's go on with the next analyzer, which happens to be one of my favorite analyzers, and it's the ion trap. So an ion trap analyzer does exactly that. It is a trap for ions. How does it work? We have the source over here, and then I have this beautiful three-dimensional drawing here with, of a box. So imagine this is actually a box. There's a round opening on one side of the box, and there's a round opening on the other side of the box. So essentially there's a tunnel through the box, two openings on opposite sides. And in the middle of the box, as you can see here rendered in beautiful 3D, we have a ring, a central ring electrode. So take it like this, you've got a hole in the box here, you've got a hole in the box there, and in the middle of the box you have this ring, and this ring electrode, and these two holes, they have a current on them. Now, the currents are a little bit special, and we'll have a look at that in a second. Our analyte comes from the source, our ions, you can see small and big ones, and they get into the trap. Now, why does the trap capture and trap ions? because it uses a sophisticated set of voltages. It has a direct current voltage and an alternating current voltage. And the alternating one has a radio frequency. So essentially it's oscillating really quickly between plus and minus. Just like your alternating current from a wall plug would do, it switches sides all the time. This is exactly what happens here and it happens really fast in a very sophisticated way. And what happens is the ions move into this trap and they see, say, a negative charge on this side, and they say, oh, let's run to the capping electrode on that side, and they start moving towards that capping electrode. But before they can reach the capping electrode, the field switches around. So now this capping electrode becomes positive, and the one behind me becomes negative. So if I'm a positively charged ion, I'm going to turn around, and now I'm going to run that way. So I'm slowed down, turned around, and I'm going back, and it switches again on me, so now I have to turn back and go back. And so I am now effectively trapped. I am constantly moving back and forth, but I never make it to the capping electrodes on time. Now, in fact, this movement happens in more than one dimension, so it's kind of a blob of ions, 
that are all in this trap and cannot get out. This is the basic premise of the iron trap. Now, this is really nice because we can actually accumulate a lot of signal, a lot of ions, so we have a total ion count that is quite high inside this trap, but we still need to figure out what kind of mass they have. Now, the way to do that is to, again, play with this voltage. We are actually going to make use of the fact that just like in a time of flight, if you put an electrical field, even though it's oscillating, every time these ions are going to be accelerated towards one of the capping electrodes. If you're a very massive ion, you're going to be accelerated at a very leisurely pace. You're going to go slowly towards the capping electrodes. But if you're very tiny, you're going to go very fast. So these small ions are very fast, and we have to switch the field quickly enough to make sure that they don't escape. Now, if we would switch just a smidgen slower, then these very tiny ions actually make it to the capping electrode and out before we switch the field. So now the capping electrode is negative. I'm a very fast ion. I move out. I'm now out of the capping electrode, which is here. Now they switch the field and I no longer care because I managed to escape the trap before they switch the field. And only the small, fast ions can do that. So if you, were to, if you do this consistently and you slowly decrease the period, what will actually happen, uh, sorry, increase the period, so it takes a longer time to switch, what will happen is the first, uh, the first ions to escape are the very small ones, and then they're all gone. And then you make the switch a little bit slower, and then the next smallest ions make it out, and the next ones, and the next ones. So you're starting on the small side of the ions, and you're moving them out until you reach the very large and slow ones. So let's see what happens. The small ones go out first, and then the bigger ones until you hit the most massive ions. And they all hit the detector. So the timing of when they hit the detector related to the voltage you've set at that time, it gives you an idea of what the mass would be of that particular ion. Now mind you, this is not as accurate as the mass determination that we had in a time of flight. Our stopwatches are simply better and our tubes are long enough to get what we call a better resolution. An ion trap does not have a very good resolution, unfortunately, because this voltage setting is not super precise. As a result, this measures mass with a little bit more of an error, and we'll come back to that later. But it's very, very useful because it traps ions, and once ions are trapped, you can accumulate them, wait for enough ions to be there to get a strong signal so that many ions, or as many as possible, hit the detector simultaneously. We'll come back to that in the next lecture, by the way. Interestingly, uh, Wolfgang Paul and Hans Georg Demelt got a Nobel Prize in 1989 for the invention of the iron trap. So the iron trap has been around for longer than, say, electrospray. Since I'm on the topic of the source again, usually iron traps are paired with electrospray sources. It's a good combination because the source continues to spray sample in, and the iron trap can accumulate a certain amount of that and then analyze it in small sections. So this is usually a combination of an electrospray source and an ion trap analyzer. It's a really nice way to work with your ions. Now, the ion trap has a, a cousin, if you like, and this cousin is the quadrupole. The principle is extremely similar, but instead of a cage, a box in which you trap the ions, we're now going to create what you could call an ion bouncer. So the the principle is very similar. You have four electrodes that are spaced, that are located in space. So there's two parallel ones, and then there's two above. So you can actually have six or eight. These days they have many more, but four will illustrate. And you put, as we said before, I now use a, a physics notation for this, a direct current field and an alternating current field with a radio frequency. And again, we're constantly shifting on these rods that are spaced in... Uh, in 3D space, we're constantly switching the voltage. So I'm an ion, I enter this hallway, if you like, of rods, and so now I'm attracted to the left rod, and now it switches, now I'm attracted to the right one, to the left one, to the right one. So I'm going to go back and forth. Now, in an ion trap, the idea was to keep ions stable, to never let them escape. Here we kind of do the opposite. What we're aiming for is what is known as constructive interference. It's the reason why soldiers who are marching in, in lockstep, that they have to break their step when they hit a bridge. Because as soon as you start walking on a bridge and everybody puts down the foot at the same time, if it happens in the right rhythm, every time the, the bridge is going to oscillate a bit because of the feet coming down, 
if you press, if everybody presses their foot onto the pavement when the bridge is at its lowest point, you're going to every single time push it deeper and deeper and deeper, and so your oscillation becomes worse and worse and worse until it breaks. This constructive interference is exactly what we want here. I am the ion, I'm moving, I go towards the left, then I move towards the right, but I don't go as far to the right as I went to the left. If I keep doing this for a few times, at some point I'm going to either fly out of these, this hallway defined by the rods, or I'm actually going to bump into one of the rods, which is actually more likely. Only a very specific ion with a, the, just the right m over z, mass over charge, will be able to maintain what is known as an overall stable trajectory. Only a very specific mass over charge will be able to move as far to the left as it moves to the right. And as a result, on average, it goes straight and makes it out of this corridor defined by the rods. Everything else is literally being thrown out. Or in this particular case, thrown against the rods, as I mentioned, which is actually quite interesting because, as you know, amino acids contain a lot of carbon. And when these rods are being hit by the amino acids, the amino acids essentially um, turn to ash. And so what you get is you get carbon scorching on these rods. And if you have a quadrupole instrument, you will know that you have to clean these rods or have them cleaned at regular intervals. They actually accumulate almost like a barbecue. They accumulate a layer of encrusted carbon that ultimately limits their effectiveness. So these things need to be cleaned as a result. As, a, as it is, it's very different from an iron trap in its actual workings because the iron trap, remember, it accumulates all the ions and then you can analyze them at leisure. Here, however, we throw most of the ions away because only one set of mass over charges can have a stable trajectory. Everything else is just wasted. So this is not usually used to analyze, say, a full spectrum of all possible masses. You could, in principle, do that. You could say, let's start with a stable trajectory for the smallest mass, the second smallest, third smallest, and then scan the whole mass range. But meanwhile, you would be throwing so much sample away. The ion trap is much better for that because all the ions we're not analyzing, they just stay put in the trap. And we have plenty of time to analyze them because they're not going anywhere. Here we waste them. So an, a quadrupole is not usually used to really scan a whole mass range or to produce full mass spectra. Instead, it's a really good bouncer. If we only care about our blue ion here, we can get rid of everything else very effectively. So that's why I refer to this as a bouncer, like at the door of a bar. You want to get in, if, you, if they don't want you to get in, the bouncer will make sure you don't get in. So that's where these things are very, very useful. But they serve as mass analyzers as well. And they're close re closely related to the iron trap in principle with the alternating electrical currents and the stable or unstable fields. Now, we've talked about the resolution of mass analyzers and there's a very specific thing about resolution that is important when it comes to determining the charge of a particular ion. Remember that we always measure mass over charge and that we have this problem that the mass over charge is a unit that we measure and we cannot get rid of this charge component. And in electrospray this is a problem because we don't know whether the molecule or the ion is 2 plus or 3 plus or 4 plus. So it's very difficult to know exactly what is there. Is it a 2000 Dalton thing, which is mass, with a charge 2? which makes it look like as if it's a thousand Daltons because we measured mass divided by charge, or is it actually a 2000 Dalton ion that has a charge of one, which gives us an M over Z of 2000. It's very difficult to figure this out. And so the, the way that you could potentially figure this out is if you have sufficient resolution. Now resolution is defined in a very vague way, but you could essentially see it as the ability to make a separation between two adjacent peaks. So how closely spaced can they be that we can still see them as separate peaks? And this is usually expressed as a, as a large number uh, at a given mass, but it can depend on the vendors. In general, higher resolution is better. You may remember from the second lecture that we mentioned the digitizer and how the digitizer samples the analog signal over time, and that if we sample more closely, we actually get better resolution. And this was an upgrade to an instrument. Well. Imagine here, if we sample here, 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 and here, we would never know about this trough in the data. 
However, if we would have a high resolution sampler that samples all the way through, we could get a very accurate re representation of this data. So that's where resolution comes in. I'll show you some real life data. This is for a very old type instrument or an iron trap, so an old tough time of flight or an iron trap would look like this. And these are actually isotopes, but we can't see the differences between the different isotopes. It essentially becomes one big pile of signal. And the best we can do is calculate an average mass. So we try to find the middle point of this distribution and we say that's roughly where the M over Z is. Do note that I use things like mass here, but you all know this is incorrect, right? It should be mass over charge. It's just a shorthand and you will see a lot of people refer to mass, assuming that you know that they're actually not measuring mass, they're measuring mass over charge. So I apologize for not being very consistent, but at least the literature is not consistent about this either. Now, that's not a very good situation because in reality, it should look like this. These are different isotopes of a given peptide and they're very nicely separated. And they're separated because we have higher resolution. We have a much more detailed view on what is actually there. And here we can use something called a monoisotopic mass. And this monoisotopic mass is the lightest isotope and referred to as monoisotopic one. That is a definition that comes from small molecules, where this problem is relatively straightforward. A small molecule tends to have only carbon-12, and so carbon-12s give you the lightest isotope, typically, and that's where you define it. I mentioned carbon-12, so you probably are familiar with isotopes, and there are many isotopes in nature. A very famous one is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is being used for radioactive dating of archaeological finds. But carbon-14 is radioactive, so it's not stable. It actually disappears over time. There are, however, stable isotopes that are pretty common. So carbon-12 is the base isotope of carbon, and it's very stable. But it has a heavier brother, which is carbon-13, which is also very stable and not radioactive. As a result, all of us, all living things and even all inanimate things contain a certain amount of carbon-13 and that amount you can find on a Mendeleev table. They will actually list the relative prevalence of the different isotopes and you will see that carbon-13 adds one Dalton to the mass. If you have one carbon-13, of course it's one Dalton. If you have two carbon-13s, it becomes two Daltons. If you have three, it becomes three. Now, I make this fuss about carbon-13, but you may know other isotopes. You may know, for instance, oxygen-18. Oxygen normal isotope is 16. That's the monoisotopic mass. But there's also a, an oxygen-18, which is also stable, non-radioactive. So that occurs in, in nature. And, of course, people know deuterium, which is the heavy form of hydrogen. Hydrogen has one uh, mass of one, and deuterium has a mass of two. So it's the proton and the neutron. So why am I not talking about these isotopes here? That is because their relative prevalence is so much lower than carbon-13. Carbon-13 is by far the most relevant isotope in living things. Deuterium is really so low in abundance that while there could be deuterium here, it's going to be negligible in the actual effect that it has on this isotopic envelope. So carbon-13 is the only one that really matters. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here, and you may have noticed this. This is the carbon-12 isotope, and carbon-12 is like 99% of all carbon atoms. And yet, this peak is smaller than that peak, which is the carbon-13. You can literally read this as saying there is more carbon-13 than there is carbon-12 in this particular molecule. That is actually a bad way of saying it. Let me try and rephrase that and say it more accurately. It is more likely that's the higher intensity, to have at least one carbon-13 in a molecule of this particular nature than it is to have only carbon-12. Now, that is actually not that hard to understand because it's a matter of simple statistics. If you have a relatively big peptide and it contains, say, 100 carbon atoms and one in 100 is likely to be carbon-13, then it's very likely that you will find one carbon-13 at least because you have a hundred carbon atoms and one in a hundred in nature is carbon-13. So you will likely to have one. 
If you have 80 carbon atoms, well, the likelihood is still going to be pretty big that at least one of them is going to be carbon-13. If, however, you have only 50 carbon atoms, well, then the likelihood goes down dramatically. And what you see here is exactly that. The bigger a peptide is, that is, the more carbon atoms it contains, the more likely it is that it has a strong second and third isotope. And in fact, you can roughly do it by mass. You can say at around about 1,800 Daltons, so 1,800 Daltons, you will see an equivalence between the first isotope and the second isotope. At about 2,000 Daltons, you will see that the second isotope is clearly bigger than the first isotope. And if you go to about 2,200 Daltons, it will look like this. Go beyond 3,000 Daltons, and it becomes very hard to spot this monoisotopic peak. And that is a problem. It is a problem because the monoisotopic peak is the one that we define for the mass of a analyte if we have sufficient resolution. So here, obviously, we cannot use that, right? So here, there is no problem. We use the average mass. Here, however, since we have the monoisotopic mass, if this carbon-12 peak becomes so small because there's so many carbon atoms in our peptide that at least one of them must be carbon-13, then we can no longer find this peak, and the peak-picking algorithms will pick the next peak and call that the carbon-12 peak, the monoisotopic peak, but they are off by one Dalton, which is a much bigger margin of error than you typically get from the measurement. So you will see that a lot of software that tries to identify peaks allows for a so-called carbon-13 switch. And the carbon-13 switch has a little bit of logic in it that says if the peptide is pretty big, then imagine that this is the wrong peak, that the mass you get is actually one Dalton, one neutron, too heavy, and we and instead use this other mass. It does have an effect here, because if we do eliminate the carbon-12 peak, it actually shifts the distribution a bit higher, but because we take an average mass, that usually means that the, the shift is smaller than here, where it really is a full Dalton, okay? So... This whole long story about isotopes, just to show you one other thing, and now we get back to the charges I promised you to talk about, is that since we know that the difference between this peak and this peak should be one neutron, and the distance between the second peak and the third peak is again one neutron, we can measure how much distance we actually see, because the m, the mass, is one Dalton of one neutron. But if we measure half and mass over charge, that means that this one neutron mass is cut in half. Therefore, we know that the mass has been divided by two. If we find that this distance is 0.33, we see that the neutron has now been divided by three, and we can read the charge state from the distance between the consecutive isotopes. And we can actually calibrate because we have multiple of these measurements. We have, we have at least two. That is how we can get from a high-resolution instrument the charge state of the analyte by taking the distance between the consecutive isotopes. So that's a really nice way to figure out this charge. And most modern instruments will have isotopic resolution. The big exception to this remains the ion trap. So the ion trap will not be able to offer it. Time-of-flight instruments can do it. And we will see later on Orvi traps and Fourier transform instruments will also be able to do it. So that is why resolution matters, and that is why you want it. Not just because it gives you more accurate mass readings, but also because it allows you to determine the charge state. And remember, for electrospray, we really need that piece of information. So with that, we're done talking about analyzers, and our next lecture will be about the detectors. Thank you very much, and see you soon.